So good morning, uh, everybody. Also, also from my uh, first, let me thank uh, 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 the organisers for the invitation to deliver this talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's my first visit to first visit to Vietnam. Also, unfortunately, it's a brief one. I should stay longer, but it's not possible. I should also say that the, by the way, that the apart from the YouTube and so forth, the slides will be available on the Bank of Finland website. After, after this presentation. So let me, here's the outline of my talk. I will just uh, very briefly uh, talk about the, the background, the historical background to the developments, then uh, more, more in Europe and a little bit internationally. Uh, then that's just a brief summary. Then, then we look at the Nordic countries. Uh, I, will, I will tell a little bit about the Nordic countries in general and then about the financial systems during the regulation time, and then we'll look at what the main, main steps of regulation were and get to the main issues and difficulties there in the Nordic deregulations and the lessons. And then also, if we have time, a little bit about the final, uh, crisis management. So there's a lot of material, especially in the first parts on the, on the slides, and I'll, I'll just go quickly over it. So, so you know, the, 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 a useful starting point really for this financial deregulation period is, is really World War II. Uh, uh, there was great, in Europe in particular, there was a great destruction on, on the war in most country, many countries, and, and, and the economies obviously had to go back to basics in some ways, ask how, how, to, how to fund the reconstruction and industrial development. That was the main goal of the financial system. And the regulatory uh, frameworks were tight controls, rationing uh, of credit controls on interest rates and, and so forth. And obviously also after World War II, the public debt levels were very high in most countries. Then, then you know, the process went on. There was a gradual lifting of financial controls that started already in the 1950s and, and continued until the 1970s in most European controls and interest rate controls were part of this. They were lifted uh, in, in depending on, some timing was different in various countries somewhat. There were other deregulations also on the financial uh, services and et cetera. I will not go into the details of these too much. The other front is the external dimension, of course. Uh, uh, and so after World War II, basically there were fixed exchange rate regimes, tight capital controls as well. Then came the Bretton Woods uh, 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 developments, the institutions, IMF, OECD, uh, European Payments Union came uh, already at the end of 40s uh, to, clear and to handle killing of, of trade balances and some trade credit. E obviously, European Economic Community, OECD. And, and this quest for also, which is important, uh, is the liberalization of capital movements. That, that was initiated already these ideas in the, in the 19, early 1960s. Some countries had, in fact, already, uh, were already without capital controls, and I'm listing some countries there. Of course, uh, then came the Bretton Woods system broke down in the early 70s, and, and that created a turbulent period, uh, period in Europe. Uh, something called the European Monetary System was created, created in the late 70s, uh, uh, that was basically a fixed exchange rates, but adjustable ones and mutual, some mutual support there. And then, then in the 1980s, this uh, trend towards capital account liberalizations uh, re was renewed in, in Europe, in the European Union. And then the Maastricht Treaty in the beginning of the 90s made it really one of the cornerstones of, of, European, uh, of European Union to have, the, have free movement of capital. You know, the banking systems and financial systems, I already mentioned that was a gradual process, and, and let me not uh, get into the details. There was, you know, it also became important in the EU level uh, uh, early on, and in particular, at, right at the end of 1980s, there was EU legislation on single banking license and single, single permit or passport for investment services, single market for financial services, etc. So there was a big, big push for, for uh, unified financial markets and financial systems, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in European Union. 
There was one exception, though, which was that the, the banking supervision was, was left at the national level. There were, there were discussions about that in the, in, the, in the 90s about that as well. If we look at the, this whole process in terms of the banking side of, in Europe, uh, the, what is remarkable is that there were very few financial crises, very few banking crises. There were problems with individual banks. So there are, there's a list there on the slides. Let me not get into it. But there were, there were four uh, major systemic banking crises as part of this process. Three Nordic countries in early 90s, and I'll come obviously get to the details as I promised, and then the other fourth case is Spain at the end of 70s or early 1980s. And these, these crises are big. I mean, there's, a, there's this well-known book and, and work by Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff, and that lists the big five crises in, in advanced market economies before the current one. And, and the three Nordic countries are there, Spain is there, and then the fifth one is Japan in the early 90s. So relative to GDP, these, the Nordic crises are big, and they, they hopefully provide some useful lessons. So let me then move on to the, to the Nordic countries. And, and the first question is obviously, why, why are they important? These are small countries, but I guess the, you know, they are generally important for considered to be advanced economies with high, with high welfare states, but nevertheless strong market economies. In terms, of the, in terms of the financial deregulation story, of course, it's the three crises that are important, make, make them important. So that's, and that's, an, that's not entirely a success story, but there are some success parts to it as well, especially in crisis management. So anyway, here's the back, brief background on Nordics. Uh, you know, I'm excluding Iceland. I should say I'm excluding Iceland. That is a fifth Nordic country, but I, this is, so this is Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. So altogether quite small population about 22 million, and they had, they've had widespread ties between themselves. Uh, for example, a common labor market was established already in the early 50s. Sweden, uh, remember, actually stayed out of World War II, so they, are, they, they had a strong, they were the wealthiest in the 1970s, and Finland had, had the biggest uh, problems with, the, with wartime there was, you know, we were heavily involved, had to defend against the country against Soviet Union, and, and we suffered a lot, but managed to, managed to keep the Soviets out of the country. And then, and so that's the, that's the, that's the setting there. Uh, as I said, the tight capital con controls finance, on finance and, cap and also foreign payments and so forth were, were in place in all of these countries right after World War II. Gradually, already at the end of 1950s, the foreign trade and associated payments schemes were liberalized. So that was an early part of the liberalization, but, uh, but, uh, but so that, that is worth perhaps noting there. More generally, these countries, of course, are known to, about their welfare state being egalitarian, socially cohesive, with a strong democratic tradition, big, relatively big public sector, and it has a, still a, a strong influence on the economy. It had much bigger influence at that time in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, as I said, uh, there were tight controls, so this financial rep repression was uh, uh, prevalent, uh, very much so, and it was, it was used as an instrument for growth and industrialization policies. You know, you have to have obviously the reconstruction after the war, especially in Finland, uh, but also in other, other countries and this quest for faster growth. And that meant, uh, that, meant that there were, uh, uh, there were, there were these, uh, here's, here's some data on it. So, so the comparison is this backward constructed data, that red line on, on, on Euro area, which you, you could view as a sort of a Western European average, and here are the four countries. So you can see, you know, this is an index number Zero uh, is at 1980. You know, 100%, 100 is at 1985, and you can see that on the whole, these these countries have been growing rather fast. You can also see in the early 90s the big financial crisis there, especially big in Finland, and I'll come back to the reason. But also Sweden, and and less so in Norway. But there were also aspects of the crisis in Norway there. It started already, in fact, in the 80s there. So that's, that's, so, so that's the growth performance. Uh, 
these countries also had high inflation, high, faster inflation than, than in several other Western European countries. So here's the reference countries are Germany in light blue and United States in, in red. And you can see in this long series of consumer prices that the inflation was uh, notably, notably faster in the Nordic, three, four Nordic countries. Here is the currencies, you know, how the exchange rate behaved against the German mark. Uh, uh, in this period from 1960 onwards, and you can see there sort of little, little uh, cliffs there, upward cliffs uh, there, and those are the de devaluations, devaluations, and, and you can see there was a trend uh, of, of, uh, that the country, uh, that these Nordic currencies weakened against the German mark, uh, and that continued until the 90s, mid-90s, uh, roughly speaking. And there were big current account deficits. So this is the here, this is somewhat shorter series from 1980 onwards, and you can see that, uh, especially if you look at uh, uh, the countries, you can see Finland almost uh, always in, in with deficits, uh, deficits until mid mid 90s. Uh, Sweden also not so systematically, but tended to have deficits. Norway is a different story. Because Norway, of course, became an oil-producing country with, with, when the oil in the North Sea and, and on, on the coasts of Norway was discovered and, and made use of in, during the 1970s, and, and they had they tended to have current account surpluses already in the early 80s, and then there was a breakdown of the OPEC cartel in 1986, which you see very clearly in the in the green line for Norway and they got into big current account deficits for, for some years. Denmark also had a tendency uh, for these current account deficits, but they started to correct the system earlier in, in mid-80s, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which is also an important observation to make. So that's, that's the background, and let me now get to the financial systems. So what, uh, here actually we have an interesting difference, which I think is a useful lesson, uh, uh, which is that Denmark uh, followed the Western European trend of gradually liberalizing the financial system uh, already earlier, uh, whereas the other three countries, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, pretty much kept the, tried to keep the tight controls on credit and banks uh, until, until 1980s. So Denmark, Denmark had this, uh, this, and they avoided a systematic, they had banking problems, some banking problems, but no, no systemic crisis in Denmark. So that's, what, that's one lesson, by the way. As I said, these, there were tight interest rate controls by the central bank, credit rationing, and, and, and planning, you know, more or less tight planning of, of credit flows in the economy by central banks. The banking systems in, in, in Finland, Norway, and Sweden, so I'm now excluding Denmark mostly from my discussion, were dominated by a few large banks, and there were then many smaller banks, savings banks. And so These were mostly private ownership, under private ownership. There were some then government-owned banks, uh, but mostly, mostly private ownership and capital for the banks uh, was raised from the private sector. The banks carried out uh, in practice the rationing rationing of credit to households and firms under the, uh, under the mon tight monitoring by the central bank. Oh. Exchange rates, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was very much the first the Bretton Woods, then after that uh, pegged the exchange rate to currency baskets. Uh, tight capital account controls uh, were in place in the 70s and 80s. There were, you know, long-term capital movements required permits and they were not necessarily easily granted. No, no short-term financial movements were allowed. The trade finance, as I mentioned, uh, was uh, relatively free already from late 1950s, and, and even foreign exchange for travel was, uh, was rationed. I remember when I was a young man, my first trips abroad, I had to get a permit from the Bank of Finland to get some uh, you know, relatively small sum of money in foreign currency. Uh, to the, when, I, when I went on my trip. Uh, the the non-bank part of the financial system was small, so there was obviously a stock market, bond markets. There was also an insurance sector, but they were kept small, and there were no major non-bank intermediaries except some special finance companies, and no for, no, no, basically no activities of foreign bank banks. 
supervision was, was a very traditional sort of uh, way focused on compliance aspects in, in lending and accounting and, and so, uh, you know, no fraud, etc. There was no risk supervision, basically. This was a sort of a traditional accounting, legal, legalistic uh, supervision activities. As I said, uh, regulated interest rates, so that restricted uh, 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 competition. So banks had to compete in some ways. These were private b banks, and there was kind of a market there. So what they tried, they tried to provide all kinds of services and new branches and so forth, even though these were regulated, but not so tight. Also, there was no, uh, these foreign banks were not allowed to establish subsidiaries there. Of course, the legal system in, in, the, in the Nordic countries was quite strong. So the you know, bankruptcy procedures, et cetera, uh, uh, were in place, uh, in place there. This overall created a very stable banking system. The loan losses were small uh, and, and, and non-existing, no crisis with them uh, in the tightly tight regulated area. Obviously, these were inefficient banks. There was large personnel, extensive branch networks, and so forth, which turned out to be quite costly and which had to be wound down to a large extent uh, or reduced in, in the, when the crisis broke up. And it's, of course, these tight controls uh, uh, protected independent monetary policy despite inter fixed exchange rates. You have to remember that the fixed exchange rate in principle, you don't have independent monetary policy, but if you have tight controls, you do. And, and so that was also the traditional mode. Then came the, uh, came the deregulation era. And that was that. Uh, the starting point of that was really the fact that uh, you know, as the countries uh, uh, grew rather well uh, in in line with Western Europe, and and in some cases like Finland, catching up with Western Europe, uh, the you know the economy became more international. There were more. There was more international trade. Firms became international, so forth. Uh, so that was one part of the story that the the countries, especially the big firms, became international. That created create pressures to liberalize. There was also, of course, the, the international organizations, IMF, OECD, and EU, also sought, sought it, uh, 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 liberalizations of markets and also capital flows. And, and, in, and the, over time, over time in, in the, especially in the 70s and beginning of 80s, leakages and loopholes to these, uh, these uh, financial controls emerged there. Various kind of form of gray domestic financial intermediation uh, started to appear. Uh, you know, the, again, the country experience is somewhat different. But for example, in Finland, what happened was that we had uh, we had a fairly extensive trade with Soviet Union, and uh, in fact, uh, that of course is not a convertible currency. But then, the the fine, you know, what happened was the two central banks, the Bank of Finland. And, uh, and, uh, their cent and the so central bank in, in, in Soviet Union had clearing accounts. So they basically, you know, the payments, you know, for example, for Finnish exports were made to the clearing account in, in Moscow, and then that came into a co corresponding balance in the Bank of Finland, and then the Bank of Finland paid in Finnish, Finnish currency, currency to the companies these export for their exports. But if, you have to remember that also the Finnish currency you know, cap, had capital controls. So the, and in fact, this trade became bigger and, and was fairly profitable. So there was the banks, so the companies had to ask, what do we do with these extra funds? We can't move them abroad. We can't them invest in abroad. If we, don't, if we have spare funds, which we, which we after our own re real investments, then, then they started to put them into this gray system. So that, that was one, one example of what, why this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, gray financial intermediation inside, inside these countries developed. And then, then the, you know, because of these, these leakages, uh, leakages and loopholes and, uh, and this tendency to go for, go for a more, uh, more open financial system internationally, these, the liberalization processes were started in the 1980s. And the, you know that involved uh, in, involves and involved a lot of individual acts. I'm not, here's the example, the timeline for Finland. I'm not going to go. You can't even probably see it, but you can look at the slides afterwards. You know, the, you know, basically the liberalization process was viewed as small steps, a large number of small steps, 
uh, going on. So if you, if you read the details, the the big parts are here are are the uh, you know basically it's 1986 onwards. You can see that the pace also to some extent tightened. Here you start to see a freeing of capital movements in the international part, uh, and here you also see that the abolish uh, the interest rate controls were abolished, etc on the domestic side. So that's, that's uh, you know, so this was the way, the way it was also viewed in the, apparently in the Bank of Finland. I was not in the Bank of Finland at that time. So, so that's, a, that's, that's, that's part of the story. So, so, so let's start to discuss this, uh, uh, what the problems in, in financial deregulation are. So the first thing to realize in, 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 in financial deregulation is that's going to be uh, impose new, new constraints on the macroeconomic policies. If you liberalize the financial system, and in particular the foreign aspects of it, the leeway of domestic macroeconomic policy is, is limited. There is this what's called the impossible trinity, which is that with free markets you cannot fix the exchange rate, domestic interest rates, and quantity of finance, which you could do under ration system. And so, so that is, you have, to, you have to let something go there, uh, something left go there. So that's, that's an important thing to realize in, in deregulation. And that, uh, you know, that, that, less, that fact was not necessarily fully appreciated at the time. Then there are a whole, a whole lot of questions you have to ask also, of course. One is that, uh, what's the order of liberalization? Do you go for the domestic liberalization first or the international part, international aspects? Usually it's the, you know, one goes for domestic liberalization first and then international uh, liberal aspects, capital movements, but, uh, but you could in principle go the other way. And obviously you have to then more specifically ask for specific markets in the financial system in which order do you liberalize them? You know, these, these markets differ in terms of the asset, in terms of maturity, what, uh, of the, what se sectoral finance, derivatives, etc. You, uh, you have to go through all of these as well. All of these as well here. So that's another important issue in, in liberalization. Uh, what, about, what about currency denominations? Do you go for domestic uh, uh, liberalization in domestic currency or foreign currencies? and also about the exports and imports of capital, which order do you do these things? And then also, what if you get into difficulties? Are there, is it possible to, possible to respond to pressures, and can you perhaps even reverse them? You see, what happened in the Nordic countries, as I showed you, uh, there, it's a long, it was a long process, but it concentrated on the second half of the 80s in, in Finland, and similarly for Sweden, Norway uh, a little bit earlier, and Denmark, as I said, is a different case. They, they turned out, in the end, they liberalized both the domestic system and the currency markets and capital movements more or less in tandem in a relatively short period. And one other aspect which is worth emphasizing is that, uh, is that you have to decide possibly about changing the taxation of finance. Is, are you going to favor debt financing by the, by, by the tax system? Is that going to be continued or not? In, 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 for example, in the case of Finland, they did not do anything with that. So, uh, so we ended up with various problems in the Nordic liberalizations, uh, and, and let me discuss those next. So, first of all, there was bad timing, especially for Finland and Sweden. The big steps, as I said, were done in the sec in right at the second half, start of second half of 1980s, and then the business cycle suddenly turned upward internationally. A part of it was the breakdown of the OPEC cartel. For Norway, of course, that meant a recession and current account deficit, so that's a different development. But they were lucky. They, in, in the case of Finland and Sweden, a big boom developed as, as a result of these deregulations and, and the international upswing in the business cycle. For Norway, as I said, they had a recession, current account deficits, and that cut that boom short. And so for Finland and Sweden, uh, the, the boom you know, led into a systemic banking, currency, and economic crisis at the start of 1980s. Finland, there were some special features. One was the fact that the, you know, for Finland, there was also the collapse of the Soviet Union in the beginning of 1990s, which was a big shock to, uh, 
Finnish export. So that, that was an additional factor that was not uh, present in the case of Sweden. Uh, uh, I mentioned Norway. They, only, uh, they, they, they had less of a boom. They had a major banking crisis, though. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Denmark had some isolated banking problems, but no systemic crisis. So that's uh, that's the that's the setting. Uh, uh, so the timing timing turned out to be turned out to be wrong. Uh, and as I said, Denmark was lucky. They they did it more gradually, as part of the European process, which on the whole was was relatively problem free. Uh, the other the other things were, were as I said, the, this deregulation was perceived as 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 a number of steps in in, in do, uh, these steps of uh, little acts of liberalisation. That focus clearly was insufficient. There was be, you know the, you know there, sh there should have been better guidance to banks, other firms, and markets uh, about you know th that the regime is going to change. You're going to change from ration system to a, a, a relatively free market where there's going to be competition with flexible prices. And that's a big change for this, because uh, this, uh, there was little realization that this liberalization to market-based finance is going to change the risk setting for, for banks and even firms and, and even households. You know, risk management viewpoint really became important, especially for banks, and that was, uh, that was uh, <coughs> not perceived early on enough. And similarly, in, in financial uh, regulation, that was not realized. It, it continued to be compliance, re con compliance regulation. And in macroeconomics, the countries tried to hold on to the fixed exchange regime, and that turned out to be problematic with free capital flows. And, and in the 90s, there was a movement to, movement to uh, uh, flexible rates and adoption of inflation targeting. So the lessons are uh, basically this financial knowledge is actually very important. You have to realize that if you go from ration systems to market-based finance, the, you know, that is a new way of, a newer way of thinking. You, traditional way of, ways of thinking can be a trap. And, it, and the reform is much more than just technical lifting of controls. The big question is, do you go for a gradual approach or a big bang? Mostly it's, it's recommended to have a gradual approach but Big Bang can work. Margaret Thatcher and UK show that you can do things almost overnight. In in in, in the foreign, you know, they liberalised capital control, uh, capital movements overnight, pretty much. And then then this timing is an, is is quite an important issue in here. And you have then macroeconomics. You have to realise why well, I already said the impossible trinity. Also the the taxation issues, and and certainly I believe that the flexible exchange rate regime is worth having before you start to open the capital movements. Otherwise, you run, run into problems like the Nordics did. There are benefits to this, uh, but there are also limits, I think. I think uh, but let me not get into that. That's a big subject on its own. So in the Nordic country, we had a financial crisis, as we saw, saw it. Uh, uh, and, and here are some slides about that. So here are, I, here are, I showed the real econ economic developments earlier. Here are some financial aspects. So here are real house prices in the four countries. And you can see that especially in Finland and Norway, uh, you know, in Finland, for example, in 10 years, uh, real house prices doubled. That's the blue line there. And then, they, then in the course of the first half of 90s, they almost came back to the old level. Not quite, but almost. That's the blue line. Norway also had a big, uh, big rise in house prices and a big decline. They came down even to the 1980 level. Sweden less so, and, and Denmark. So they, they are, there are some differences there. Here's the share prices. Share prices, and so the important part is this period here. This is, of course, the IT boom, so you should not look at that too much, uh, too much so here. But you, again, you see that, again, big boom for Finland in, in share prices. Also, also for Sweden, these of course were uh, countries we'd had, had uh, Nokia and Ericsson respectively, uh, and, and had a fairly big IT sector. Less so in Norway, they, they had much less of IT at that time. Here's bank lending growth. You can also see that in the, in the second half of 80s, a little bit earlier in Norway, there were big increases in bank lending and then neg you know, negative lending growth for, especially for Finland and Sweden for, for, about, for about three years or so. And, and loan losses for banks, 
these are, uh, you can see these are, again, the, the crisis period there and, and operating profits also turned negative in, in this part. So the crisis management, I don't have time to go into details of the crisis management, but there were also some interesting lessons. In the, in the case of Finland, for example, there was no legislation how to handle financial crisis. So when it erupted in this one bank, Skop Bank, which was the sort of a central bank uh, uh, for the savings bank system, the Bank of Finland had to take directly over. You had to take over it and, and, and you know, get the, buy the old, old shareholders out. Out and, and then, then things started to happen. Then government set up a crisis management agency and various steps were introduced. One interesting feature is, is a, a bit of a novelty here is, is this, that the, you know, the, we have to recapitalize the banks. In the case of Finland, you know, there, was, there was some nationalization. The savings banks eventually had to be nationalized and, and, and actually you know, split. Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, reason, reasonable parts sold unless others became losses. But Finland managed, for the other banks, Finland used something called preferred capital certificates to finance them. So these were instruments which were, you know, it, it was like a loan, but it, it could be counted as capital because they would turn into shares if not repaid in five years. So that's actually similar to what the TARP scheme in the US, US used eventually. There were guarantees and so forth as well. So, but it took uh, quite a long time. Uh, the Finnish banks became profitable in '96 already. There was, as part of that, there were restructurings of banks. Savings banks disappeared largely, very, with a few small exceptions. There was also a merger of the commercial banks, uh, so forth. The staff in the banks uh, was basically halved in five years. Branches were closed, and so forth. So, big restructuring was was done there. Sweden, uh, you know, a somewhat similar story. Uh, uh, let me not get into the details. They also said they, they also did not have the legislation for crisis resolution agency, but that was already set up and public support uh, criteria with strict criteria also introduced. And so, and and Norway, Norway had, in, they in fact had uh, private uh, guarantee funds for the banks. Uh, and and they, they, they were used, but they were not sufficient, and they were exhausted, so the government had to set up a, a guarantee fund and a, and a crisis management agency for this. Uh, for this. And then, uh, they, they, remember, they didn't have a big recession, but they had a big banking crisis. And then they, they actually took a very fairly radical step in, in, in the early 1992. They nationalized the biggest problem banks including the biggest, three biggest commercial banks were nationalized. The old shareholders were wiped out. These were taken over by the government because the government basically said, these are bankrupt banks, we will take over and the shares are gonna be, uh, well. Uh, and so they, and they, they in fact then had an issue that the government became an owner of the banks and, and that's not an easy thing, situation either if you are, have a, a banks in the market system and how to run them how to keep a reasonably level playing field against the non-nationalized banks, with the non-nationalized banks, etc. But they sold them a, a few years, you know, gradually. The first one was sold about uh, three, four years afterwards, and so forth. The interesting thing is, is th th this, this is, is this figure, which estimates, the, uh, which provides data. This is not my data, but uh, from a Norwegian publication, the gross fiscal cost and the net fiscal cost in the three crises. There are, there are, of course, no unique way to do it. You have to, which baseline relative to GDP you have to decide, and then how long a period do you allow for recovering the, the initial out, uh, public spending to the banking crisis. But one big lesson is that the net fiscal cost in the longer term is gonna be much smaller. So you can see that in the case of Finland, it basically have. In the case of Norway, the net cost was even negative, slightly negative. They, they managed to sell the banks at a good price eventually, the nationalized banks. And in Sweden also, the, you know, it dropped almost to zero according to these numbers, uh, uh, these numbers. So that's, 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 that's a big, you, you know, the government can, you know, they will acquire assets when they manage the banking crisis. And, and, and then it's a question, how do you sell them? 
how do you sell them? Obviously, how do you acquire them, but how do you sell them eventually? And don't sell them necessarily too quickly. It's a difficult decision to make, but that's what, uh, what this tells you. The net fiscal cost is quite a bit lesser. So let me then conclude with some general lessons from the crisis management part of it, which is obviously the first lesson is that prevention of the crisis is a big priority. As we saw, uh, especially Finland and Sweden, uh, the, the, the financial crisis can be very costly if it's a major financial crisis. It's not easy to diagnose the, the overheating situation, but there are some hints there which, are, you know, uh, which you might want to look at. The crisis management uh, part is, is uh, if, if it comes to that, you know, obviously one, the first thing you have to do is, is that you have to maintain confidence in the banking system. Uh, the banking system, uh, uh, obviously nowadays the banking systems are quite complex, they were simpler then, but it, it, there are two basic things which are important for the society of the banks. One is, of course, uh, is the fact, is the ordinary lending uh, lending uh, and in financial intermediation for standard loans to businesses and households. If that breaks down, then, then things are going to be... And the other one is the payment system. If the, pay, if the banks really get into difficulties so that in nowadays, of course, in West, you know, certainly in the Western world, it's, it's electronic payments. If that got into difficulties, then that would, that would quickly bring the economy to a standstill if you can't make payments through the banking system. They, that's their responsibility. So that is, that's an important starting point. And then it's, a, you know, in, 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 in the Nordic countries, there were, you know, there was broad uh, political support, was, was obviously debates at first, but eventually that came, and relatively quickly. And, and then there were guarantees to banks' obligations in Finland and Sweden. Norway did not provide a general guarantee, but they made very specific statements to that respect. This can be problematic if the banking crisis gets even bigger than than, in, than the Nordic crisis, as we've seen in the Irish case, for example, now, or the Icelandic case where they did something else. The central banks, obviously, liquidity support, keep the banking system running is, is quite important. We, the Bank of Finland had a special problem, which was the fact that there was no legislation. You had to directly take over a bank and, 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 and put, put in new management to run it. The two agencies are important, uh, crisis resolution, so the Ministry of Finance has to take overall responsibility here, and, and they have to guide the restructuring of the banking system, etc. And also, you, the government will acquire assets uh, when, when handling this crisis, so asset management companies need to be, need to be uh, established uh, and, and to deal with these non-performing assets, and, and that is, that's also something that was well learned, I think, in the Nordic, in the Nordic crisis management that you have, and you, you want to keep it separate. You, you let the professionals run the asset management companies, and then you, have, then you have this issue, what do you do with the assets in the longer term? How do you sell them? What time horizons do you have, and so forth? And I think, uh, you know, the, as I said, the Nordic countries, even though they are often considered to be role models, the re deregulation did not turn out well, as I've t as been telling you, but the crisis management has been, you know, so has been a better story. So these, these steps here, that you have to restructure the banking system, make it more efficient typically here. You will need a, gov uh, a fairly independent government agency to deal with this, this process, and you also need the asset management company. And you have to, and the fact, general toughness with the banks and timely action, clear, transparent, timely action is very important in, in managing a, a, a financial crisis. And I think these were some of the lessons that were learned from the Nordic crisis. Thank you.